Welcome back to this introductory course on the general linear model. Today we're delving into a bit of a more specialist topic, which is logistic regression, predicting a binary outcome with one or more predictors of any measurement level. First, let's recap what we've covered so far. We've discussed bivariate linear regression, where you predict a continuous outcome variable from a continuous predictor. We've covered the special case where the predictor X is a dummy variable so that you can use it to compare two groups. And this use of the general linear model is equivalent to the independent samples t-test. We've also extended our linear regression model by adding blocks of predictors where each block had the shape plus B times X. And if all of the predictor variables are dummies coding for membership of groups of one categorical variable, then this is equivalent to ANOVA. And we've covered the more general case where the predictors can have any measurement level and they can be categorical, binary, continuous. And this general case is called multiple regression. Finally, we've covered one extension of the general linear model where you multiply two predictors together and include that product term in the model as well. And this allows you to model an interaction effect where the effect of one predictor depends on the value of another. But today we're going even further and we're introducing logistic regression. Logistic regression is regression with a binary dependent variable. So until now, we've never varied the measurement level of the outcome, only of the predictors. But in this case, we're looking at a binary outcome variable. In order to be able to model a binary outcome, we have to predict a transformation of the dependent variable rather than just the raw scores. So what changes in comparison to previous applications of the general linear model is that we are no longer predicting the dependent variable y, but we're predicting a function of y. Specifically, that function is the log of the odds of observing y equals one given the predictors x. Why would we use logistic regression? Well, we can use logistic regression any time that the outcome variable is a binary categorical variable, either nominal or ordinal. As you know from previous lectures, we can code such outcomes as dummy variables. For example, whether a customer bought one versus did not buy zero a product, or whether a person helped one or did not help zero somebody in need, or whether a patient has one or does not have zero a neurological disease. Throughout this lecture, we'll be using some example data about a study on chimpanzees. And this example is inspired by Richard McElrath. He presents a study of prosocial behavior in chimps. Imagine an experiment where a chimpanzee pulls one of two levers. Both of these levers deliver a tasty treat to the chimp but one of the levers additionally delivers a treat to a second chimp. And the outcome variable is whether or not the chimp pulled the lever that delivers a treat to the other one as well, or not. But there are two conditions. In one condition, the chimp is alone, so there should be no incentive for them to pull one lever or the other. And in the other condition, the chimp is together with a second chimp. There is also one covariate, namely some kind of average score of the chimp's performance in a bunch of other tests. You can think of this covariate as chimp intelligence. So what do we expect to observe? Well, if chimpanzees are prosocial, then we would expect to see an increase in the probability of pulling the lever that delivers a treat to them and to another chimp, but only if that other chimp is present, so if they're together. Can we just use linear regression to analyze these data? For the moment, let's forget about the alone condition and focus only on data from the together condition, where it makes sense for the chimp to pull the lever that delivers a treat to both individuals. You can see the fake data in the plot below. And we might ask, does test score, so chimp intelligence, predict pro-social choices? Well, it does look like Chimps with higher test scores are more likely to pull the pro-social lever. So if we do use standard linear regression, then maybe we could interpret this regression line as the predicted probability of pulling the lever. 
But we immediately observe a problem as well, which is that if we treat this regression line as predicted probability, of course the regression line continues to minus infinity and to plus infinity, but probabilities are bounded between 0 and 1. So if we wanted to just use bivariate linear regression, we would not be allowed to extrapolate. We also observe violation of assumptions. For example, if we get a residual plot, there are only two outcome values, so you'll see this really weird linear pattern in the residuals as well, which violates the assumption of normal residuals and the assumption of homoscedasticity. Here you can see that the assumption of normal residuals is also violated. So we get kind of two humps for the residuals, and that's definitely not normal. So what's wrong with using linear regression for a binary outcome variable? Well, there are several problems. One problem is that the linear regression will predict impossible probabilities outside of the range of 0 and 1. The residuals will be heteroscedastic, and they will be non-normal. So what would be the ideal solution? Well, ideally, we would transform the predicted outcomes using a function that limits them to the range between 0 and 1. And we could use a different distribution for the residuals, one that does not assume normality and does not assume homoscedasticity. And this is where I introduce the logit. That is that transformation of the dependent variable. So the logit is defined as the log odds of the outcome being present versus absent. So the logit of probability p is defined as taking the natural log of the probability p divided by 1 minus the probability p. So this is the natural logarithm of the probability of something happening divided by the probability of it not happening. And that fraction is known as the odds of the thing happening. If we use regression to predict the logit of the probability instead of just the probability of y, then we get this nice sigmoid-shaped function. And that function is bounded between 0 and 1. So we solved one of our problems, namely the problem of extrapolation. Like I said before, we also have to use a different error family. So previously, we've always assumed that the prediction errors would be normally distributed. And we wrote the regression function as follows. The individual observed values on y are equal to an intercept plus a slope times the individual values on x plus prediction error epsilon sub i, where epsilon sub i is normally distributed with a mean of zero. That means normally distributed around the regression line with some error standard deviation. But when we use logistic regression, we instead assume a Bernoulli error distribution. And think back to the second lecture of this course where I explained that there would be many different probability distributions. We focus mostly on the normal probability distribution, but here is a different one, the Bernoulli probability distribution. Bernoulli distributions are used to represent the probability of observing a certain outcome in binary random experiments, like flipping a coin. The outcomes are coded as either 0 or 1, and a Bernoulli distribution has only one parameter, namely the probability of observing a 1. So where the standard normal distribution has two parameters, namely a mean and a standard deviation, the Bernoulli distribution only has one parameter, namely the probability p. So in logistic regression, we assume that the outcome is Bernoulli distributed. Each participant thus has an individual probability of success, which is p sub i, the individual probability. And we then assume that the observed outcomes y sub i are Bernoulli distributed with probability p sub i. The logit of this probability of success is then defined as a linear function of the predictors. So the regression model becomes the logit of the individual probabilities of success is a linear function with an intercept a plus a slope b times the individual values on the predictors x sub i. So do you spot here our familiar linear model? So if we compare the naive bivariate linear regression model 
with the logistic regression model, we see that the linear regression model makes all kinds of errors when used to describe binary outcome data. Namely, it extrapolates beyond the possible range of 0 and 1. The residuals are not normal and they are heteroscedastic. But when we apply the logistic regression, we get this nice S-shaped or sigmoid function with Bernoulli distributed errors. In order to work with logistic regression, it is important that you understand the distinction between probability, odds, and the logit. We have talked about probability before, and recall that for any random experiment, probability is defined as the long-run proportion of observing a particular outcome. So if we were to flip a coin 100,000 times, we would expect to see heads 50,000 times. So the probability of observing heads is 50,000 divided by 100,000 is 0.5. In these empirical data on chimpanzee behavior, the overall probability of acting prosocially is 0.86. So 68% of the time, regardless of condition, the chimpanzees pull the prosocial lever. We can simply convert a probability to odds as follows. Then a second important term is the odds, and the odds are defined as the probability of an event occurring divided by the probability of the event not occurring. So the odds are the probability of success divided by the probability of failure in other words, the probability of success divided by 1 minus the probability of success. So, given that we know that the probability of our chimpanzees acting prosocially is 0.86, the odds of our chimpanzees acting prosocially are 0.86 divided by 1 minus 0.86 is 6.17. Now, odds are pretty commonly used in the gambling world and they tell us how much more likely it is to observe the outcome than to not observe the outcome. So for example, at a casino, if there's a game where you're two times more likely to win than to lose, so the odds would be 0.66 divided by 0.33 is two, you should absolutely play that game. But more likely, the odds will be always in favor of the house, so they will be smaller than one. So more realistically, I might be more than twice as likely to lose as win. So the odds might be 0.33 divided by 0.66 is 0.5. So that means I am half as likely to win as I am to lose. The final relevant term is the logit, and we use the logit to convert these odds to a linear function, which allows us to use linear regression. So the logit is simply the log of the odds, so the log of p divided by 1 minus p. So here's a table summarizing how you can convert from probability to odds, and from odds to probability, and from odds to logit, logit to odds, and logit to probability, and the other way around. You don't have to know all of these formulas, but you do have to be able to calculate with them. So we get the odds from probability, by dividing the probability by 1 minus the probability, and we can go back to probability by taking the odds and dividing them by 1 plus the odds. We can get the logit by taking the natural logarithm of the odds, and we can get back the odds by taking the exponent of the logit. We can get the logit directly from the probability by calculating the log of p divided by 1 minus p, mind your brackets, and we can get the probability by taking the exponent of the logit and dividing that by 1 plus the exponent of the logit. So how about model estimation when we use logistic regression? In all previous examples of the general linear model, we were able to use ordinary least squares regression, which is a simple matrix algebra transformation of the data that gives us all of our regression coefficients. When we want to use logistic regression, however, we can no longer use ordinary least squares. We have to use a different algorithm to solve for the parameter values of our regression coefficients. And that algorithm is maximum likelihood. Now, fully understanding this algorithm is outside of the scope of this course, but I will give you an intuitive understanding of what it is and how it's different from ordinary least squares regression. 
The basics of maximum likelihood estimation are as follows. Imagine that we're trying to model the logit of the individual predicted probabilities, p sub i with a hat on, as a linear function of several predictors. There are two unknown model parameters, the intercept a and the slope b. We have to estimate these. When we use maximum likelihood, we start with random values for a and b. Then we use these random values to calculate the model implied probabilities, p sub i, just by filling in the formula. For each individual i, we can then calculate the likelihood of observing their outcome, y sub i, so that is a true value of either 0 or 1, in a Bernoulli distribution with that probability, p sub i, that was estimated according to the model. We can multiply all of those probabilities across all of the individuals in our sample to get the likelihood L, and that likelihood tells us how likely is it to observe the observed outcome values that we have given these two parameter values. And high values of the likelihood L mean that the observed outcome values are very likely given the parameter values for A and B. Now, because we started with random values, the likelihood is going to be relatively low. But then we can change the values of A and B a little bit. And we can check if the likelihood has become larger. And we can keep repeating steps 2 until 6 until we find the highest possible value for the likelihood. And that is the maximum likelihood. And we can then say that the values we found for A and B are the maximum likelihood solution, the combination of values that gives us the highest possible likelihood. So let's have a little look at the coefficients in the logistic regression model. We have, as I mentioned before, an intercept A and a slope B. So if we change the intercept A, then we basically move the inflection point of the function. So for more positive values of A, the inflection point moves down to below zero, and for more negative values of A, the inflection point moves up. So if we have a very large negative value for A, that means you need a really high value on X before your predicted probability switches from near zero to near one. B, on the other hand, tells us how steep the transition is from a predicted probability of 0 to a predicted probability of 1. So higher values of b mean that the transition is more abrupt. So for very high values of b, we can make a near perfect distinction between the people with a predicted probability of 0 down here and the people with a predicted probability of 1 up here. But if we enter a very low value like 0.1, then that transition is extremely gradual. So how can we interpret these coefficients? Well, like I just illustrated, the intercept A determines where the function intersects a probability of 0.5. We call that point where the function intersects 0.5 the inflection point. And you can easily calculate at which value of the predictor, and you can easily calculate at which value of the predictor x the inflection point occurs by taking negative the intercept divided by the slope. And then the slope b determines how steeply the function switches from predicting 0 to predicting 1, with larger values of b indicating a steeper, so more abrupt, transition. If the slope is positive, then the function ascends, which means that it starts by predicting a value of 0 for low values of x, and it transitions to predicting a value of 1 for higher values of x. But if the slope is negative, then the function descends. So it starts by predicting a value of 1 for low values of x, and then transitions to predicting a value of 0 for high values of x. In other words, a positive regression slope b implies an s shape for the function, and a negative slope of z implies a z shape for the function. So let's look at some example coefficients from a logistic regression with our chimpanzee data. So again, this is only for the chimpanzees in the together condition. 
and their test scores on chimp intelligence range from 0 to 5. So our regression equation can be described as follows. The logit of the individual predicted probabilities of acting prosocially is equal to the intercept A plus B times their individual test scores. And then for that intercept, we see a negative value. And that means that chimps need to have a higher positive test score before they transition to prosocial behavior. And the slope of test score is 2.12. And that means that we expect to see an S-shaped curve. So they start with a low probability of acting prosocially, and as they become more intelligent, they transition to a high probability of acting prosocially, which makes sense. We get a standard error for both of these coefficients, which we can use to calculate a z-score, which gives us a p-value, and both of these have a very small p-value, so the coefficients are significantly different from zero. How can we interpret the intercept? Well, the intercept gives us the log odds of scoring 1 on y for someone who scores 0 on all predictors. We can convert that to the probability of scoring 1 on y for someone who scores 0 on all predictors by taking the exponent of the intercept divided by 1 plus the exponent of the intercept. So, for example, in our model with chimps, the intercept was minus 2.46, and that means that the probability of acting prosocially for a chimp with a test score of 0 is the exponent of minus 2.46 divided by 1 plus the exponent of 2.46 is 0 0.08. And how can we interpret the slope? Well, the slope b is a change in logit for a one unit increase in the predictor x, keeping all other predictors constant. In other words, a one unit increase in x multiplies the odds of the outcome by the exponent of the slope. And for this reason, it is interesting to report the exponent of logistic regression coefficients, because it allows us to calculate by how much the odds of the outcome are multiplied for a one point increase in x. So let's look at our example again. As I mentioned, chimp test score ranges from 0 to 5, so we could easily fill out the formula and calculate the predicted logit for a test score of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then we could convert that to the odds of observing prosocial behavior and to the probability of observing prosocial behavior. And what we see is that for chimps with a test score of 0, the logit is minus 2.46 because if test score is 0, then this is multiplied by 0 and this cancelled out. So we just get the intercept. And that corresponds to an odds of 0 0.09, which corresponds to a probability of 0 0.08. For a test score of 1, we get minus 2.46 plus 2.12. So that's going to be a very small negative value, minus 0.34 which corresponds to an odds of 0.71 and a probability of 0.42, so already nearly 50-50. And then for a test score of 2, we do minus 2.46 plus 2 times 2.12 is 1.78, which corresponds to an odds of nearly 6, so already pro-social behavior is nearly 6 times more likely than antisocial behavior. And that corresponds to a probability of 0.86. And we can keep going, but we see that as soon as we get above a test score of about 3, the probability of prosocial behavior is already nearly 100%. It's very easy to make such a table yourself in a spreadsheet, and it can be very instructive when you're trying to interpret the results of logistic regression. The formula are as follows. In the first cell, you enter the value of the predictor x. In the second cell, you enter a formula equals a plus b times a1. So this refers back to that first cell. And then in the third cell, c1, you also enter a formula, namely the exponent of whatever is in cell b1. And in cell d1, you enter a formula equals the cell c1 divided by 1 plus the cell of c1. So that gives you the probability. And then you can just select this row of cells and drag it down to copy it. And you can enter whichever values you want for specific scores on the predictor.
So I mentioned before that it's useful to take the exponent of the regression coefficient in logistic regression. The technical term for this is the odds ratio. So if we imagine, for example, a binary predictor, so a dummy variable predictor, then we can define the odds ratio as the odds that an outcome will occur given a particular exposure, so given a value of 1 for this dummy variable, compared to the odds of the outcome occurring in the absence of that exposure, so given a value of 0 for that predictor. In a more general sense, the exponent of the regression coefficient is the odds ratio associated with a one unit increase in the predictor. So that means that if you want to calculate the odds of observing the outcome for a particular value of the predictor compared to one point higher on that predictor, you can multiply the original odds with the exponent of the regression coefficient. So for binary predictors, the odds ratio is also a very sensible effect size because only the value 0 and 1 occur for that predictor. So the odds ratio tells you everything you need to know about how much the odds change if you go from condition equals 0 to condition equals 1. As for interpretation of the odds ratio, an odds ratio equal to 1 means that the exposure, so your binary predictor, does not affect the odds of the outcome. An odds ratio greater than 1 means that if you go from 0 to 1 on your exposure variable, uh, there is a higher odds of observing the outcome. And an odds ratio smaller than 1 means that exposure is associated with lower odds of the outcome. Of course, we may also have hypotheses about regression coefficients in logistic regression. And in this context, it's useful that you can use either a z-test or a wald test. I've previously showed you the z-test where you just divide the coefficient by its standard error and then look up the p-value in a z-distribution. But SPSS instead uses what's called a wald test. So again, as always, the default null hypothesis is that the parameter is equal to zero. Then you could calculate a walled test statistic by taking the observed regression coefficient minus this null hypothesis, so minus zero, dividing that by the standard error and squaring the result. And that test statistic will be chi-square distributed with a single degree of freedom. So when you look at the tests in the SPSS output, they are these kind of walled test statistics. How do you report the results of logistic regression? Well, you could say, for example, there was a significant effect of test score on prosocial behavior, report the regression coefficient, and the chi-square test statistic with one degree of freedom was equal to 23.85, and the corresponding p-value is smaller than 0.01. This means that for a one unit increase in test score, the odds of prosocial behavior are multiplied by 8.35. That's the exponent of this b. The inflection point of the logistic regression was 1.16. For chimpanzees with higher test scores than this value, the predicted probability of prosocial behavior exceeds 0.5. When you conduct logistic regression, you may want to evaluate your model's performance. In the standard general linear model, we were able to use explained variance, or R squared, for this purpose. But we can't calculate that for logistic regression because there's no variance in a binary outcome variable. So we have to come up with alternative metrics. When we're trying to evaluate model fit, it's useful to know that this likelihood L which I mentioned before when I explained maximum likelihood estimation, can be used as a model fit measure. The only problem is that it's not on any meaningful scale. So the value of the likelihood depends on the data at hand, and you can use it to compare different models estimated on the same data, but you can't use it to evaluate the objective goodness of fit of your model. If we take the log of the likelihood and multiply it by minus 2, we get a test statistic that is chi-square distributed called the minus 2 log likelihood. And because it is chi-square distributed, we can use the minus 2 log likelihood to perform a chi-square test to determine whether the model significantly fits or actually misfits the data. 
But more interestingly, we can compare the minus two log likelihood statistics for two nested models to see whether one fits significantly better than the other. And for this purpose, we conduct what is called a likelihood ratio test. That is a chi-square test for the difference in minus two log likelihoods of two nested models. And I explained in a previous lecture what nested models are. So to get the likelihood ratio test statistic, we take the minus two log likelihood of the null model, so the simpler model, and we subtract the minus two log likelihood of the more complex model. This likelihood ratio is itself also chi-square distributed with degrees of freedom equal to the difference in the number of parameters between the two models. So if we add two parameters to the more complex model relative to the null model, then our degrees of freedom are two. And these likelihood ratio tests for nested models take the place of our familiar F-test for nested model comparisons from ordinary least squares regression. As I mentioned before, the likelihood is not on any meaningful scale. But of course, clever statisticians have tried to rescale it to make it more similar to an r square type measure that could be used to evaluate objective model fit. And this brings me to the pseudo r square. As you know, the r square is a measure of explained variance, but logistic regression does not explain variance, rather it just predicts a binary outcome. So people have tried to create statistics to behave that behave somewhat similar to the R-square, but this is a little bit controversial. So what these pseudo R-square measures do is they rescale the minus two log likelihood of a model to fall in a range between zero and one, just like the familiar R-square. There's no agreed upon way to do this because it's a little controversial. But all of these measures have in common that higher scores imply better fit. They're still not a good measure of objective model fit. Although they are bounded between zero and one, they don't scale meaningfully with fit. But they can be used as relative model fit measures to compare how well different nested models fit and which one of them is the best. So just keep in mind that pseudo R square measures are measures of relative model fit. They're only valid for comparing models on the same data set and they are not a measure of absolute fit or of effect size. So here are two examples of common pseudo R square values. There is Cox and Snell, which is a generalization of the normal R square. So for ordinary least squares regression, the Cox Snell pseudo R square is equal to the normal R square. But for logistic regression, of course, it's not the same. And for logistic regression, it is the case that Cox and Snell's R-square can never be equal to one. So it is always somewhere between zero and a value that is smaller than one. And then there is Nagelkerke's R-square, and it divides Cox and Snell's R-square by its maximum theoretically possible value, which effectively just rescales it to be bounded by zero and one. So Nagel-Kerker's R-square is always going to be a little bit bigger than Cox and Snell's R-square, and it can actually reach a value of one. One very common application of logistic regression is to try to classify individuals or cases into two different categories. As I explained previously, logistic regression gives you predicted probabilities for every single individual of observing the outcome y equals one, given the specific values on predictors for that individual. But we can use these predicted probabilities for classification by just categorizing them into two groups using an arbitrary cutoff point. The act of binary classification means determining whether any given individual is likely to have a value of y equals zero or a value of y equals one. So to use logistic regression for binary classification, you apply a simple decision rule. For example, I will classify an individual as being likely to have the value y equals one if their predicted probability exceeds 0.5, and I will classify them as being likely to have the value zero if their predicted probability is smaller than. But you are free to use other classification rules as well. 
Many people have debated about whether it is sensible or not to classify individuals after using logistic regression. Because logistic regression is so beautiful, it predicts an exact probability for every individual, and then you lose that information by categorizing that into just two groups. Sometimes, however, it can be very useful to classify. For example, if you are a producer of climbing ropes, you may want to use logistic regression to predict the probability that an individual rope will meet the safety standards based on some non-destructive tests, like stretching the rope. Then you could apply a classification rule. Any ropes with a probability greater than 0.01 that they do not meet the standards are destroyed or recycled. The rest go to market. And you could do this to prevent ropes that have even the slightest probability of being faulty from ever reaching consumers. If we use logistic regression to classify, of course we want to know how accurate is my classification. How well does the classification correspond with the true positives and the true negatives in the data? In order to evaluate the classification accuracy, we can create what's called a classification table. And to do this, we first calculate the predicted probability for each individual, P sub i. Then we apply our specific cutoff, for example, 0.05, or in the previous example, it was 0.01, to dichotomize these probabilities. So we say, if the predicted probability is greater than 0.05, then the person will be classified as having the value 1, and otherwise they will be classified as having the value 0. Then we cross-tabulate the observed outcome, y sub i, against the classification decisions, y hat sub i. And then we can check how accurate are these classification decisions, and where do we see the most prediction errors. And keep in mind that this cutoff value is arbitrary. We can use a different cutoff. But there will always be a trade-off between the number of false positives and the number of false negatives. Right? So if we choose a different cutoff, we may get fewer false positives, but then by definition we get more false negatives, and vice versa. At this point, I have to give a clear warning. The classification table and any statistics that are derived from it are not measures of model fit for the logistic regression. The measure of model fit is the minus two log likelihood because the model itself predicts exact probabilities for every individual and the classification decision follows after the modeling step and after evaluating the fit of the model and the classification step completely ignores the uncertainty about the classification decision. So the model predicts exact probabilities for every individual. Classification is a step that follows after estimating the model in which we just categorize people into two binary groups, ignoring that exact predicted probability. So let's look at what happens when we put it all together. In the chimpanzees example, we have a dependent variable y, which is pro-social, whether or not the chimp pulled the lever. And we have two predictors, these are our x variables, namely condition, whether the chimp is alone, zero, or together with another chimp, one. And those are recoded into a dummy variable called d together, which has a value one if the chimp is together. And we have a continuous predictor called test score, and that represents the average test score in other experiments, which is a proxy for chimp intelligence. Now, because we think that it only makes sense for chimps to pull the prosocial lever when they are together, we additionally compute an interaction term. So we compute test multiplied by together as the test score multiplied by the dummy for together. And then we have two research questions. The first research question is, is there an effect of condition on prosocial behavior? And the second research question is, smart chimpanzees might be more inclined to act pro-socially when another chimp is present. Is there an interaction between condition and test score? So first we estimate a model with only the dummy for being together as a predictor. And we see that we get a chi-square test of model fit. 
and we see that the model fit is significant. So this model with one predictor is better than a model with no predictors. We also see the pseudo R square measures reported. And as I mentioned before, the original model fit measure is the minus two log likelihood. Cox and Snell's pseudo R square rescales this to a value between zero and somewhere smaller than one. And Nagelkerke divides the Cox and Snell by the maximum possible value of Cox and Snell to rescale it from zero to one. Then finally, we see this classification table. So if we use an arbitrary cutoff value of 0.5 to classify chimps into prosocial or non-prosocial behavior, then we get this classification table. So here is the observed behavior, so the actual outcome variable y. And there we see that there were a bunch of chimps who did not act prosocially. And out of those chimps, for 112, the model also predicted that they would not act prosocially. But for 23 of them, the model predicted that they would act prosocially. So the percentage of correct classification decisions here is 83%. And there were also a bunch of chimps that did act prosocially. And for those chimps, for 43 of them, the model predicted that they would not act prosocially. And for 142, the model predicted that they would act prosocially. So these are the true positives. And these are the false positives. And these are the true negatives. And these are the false negatives. And then we can see that the overall percentage of correct model predictions is 79.4%. We can also look at the model coefficients. So what we see is that the intercept is minus 0.96 and the slope is 2.78. And we see that we get a standard error for both and a wall test with one degree of freedom and a corresponding p-value. And we get the exponent of the regression slope and we get a confidence interval as well. So we can convert these regression coefficients and their exponents to probabilities. And the probability of observing prosocial behavior when condition is equal to zero is simply the exponent of the intercept divided by one plus the exponent of the intercept is 0.28. So in the control condition, when the chimp is alone, they have a 28% probability of pulling the prosocial lever. And then we can also calculate the probability of observing prosocial behavior when they are in the together condition, so when condition is equal to one. And that probability is equal to the exponent of the intercept plus the slope divided by one plus the exponent of the intercept plus the slope. So if we fill in the values for the intercept and the slope here, then we can calculate that that probability is 0.86. We can also look at the coefficients on the odds scale. So as you can see here, if we take the exponent of the slope, then the odds of observing prosocial behavior, which are represented by the intercept, are 0.38. And we can calculate that by hand to verify it, namely the exponent of minus 0.96, which is the intercept, is indeed 0.38. And the odds of prosocial behavior when condition is one, can be calculated by taking the exponent of the slope for the effect of the condition dummy, multiplying that by the baseline odds of observing prosocial behavior, and then we get 6.18. So the odds when condition equals one are 6.18. And then we can calculate the effect size, which is an odds ratio, by taking the odds of observing prosocial behavior when condition equals one, and dividing that by the baseline odds of observing prosocial behavior when condition equals zero, that is 6.18 divided by 0.38 is 16.8, and that corresponds to the exponent of the regression slope. So indeed, the exponent of the slope for this dummy predictor gives us the effect size on an odds ratio scale. And of course, we can also flip the odds ratio how much more less likely is it to observe prosocial behavior when there is no other chimp present versus when there is another chimp present just by flipping this 
just by flipping the nominator and the denominator so we could take 0.38 divided by 6.18 and then the odds ratio is 0.06. Now let's add our interaction term to the model. Again, first we get a chi-square test of model fit and we see that the model with these three predictors fits significantly better than a model with no predictors. We can perform a likelihood ratio test to see whether this model also fits significantly better than a model with only condition as predictor. So recall that the minus 2 log likelihood of the model with only condition as predictor was 316. We see that here. And now we have added two predictors and we get a minus 2 log likelihood of 269.45. So we could calculate the likelihood ratio by taking the minus 2 log likelihood of the simpler model minus the minus 2 log likelihood of the more complex model. So that's 316 minus 269 and we get 46.88 as our likelihood ratio. Because we added two predictors, namely the continuous predictor and the interaction term, we have two degrees of freedom. So we could perform a chi-square test for the likelihood ratio with two degrees of freedom. And that is actually what we see here in the step and the block result. And we see that that likelihood ratio with two degrees of freedom is significant. In other words, adding these two predictors significantly improved the model fit compared to a model with only one predictor. Again, we get a pseudo R-square and notice that those are both higher than for the simpler model, which again reaffirms our conclusion that the model with three predictors fits better than the model with only one predictor. And we can look at the classification accuracy. So because our model fit better, we also expect to see some kind of improvement in the classification accuracy. Previously, we had 23 false positives and 43 false negatives. In other words, the model made 66 incorrect classifications. And for the more complex model, we see 17 false positives, so a reduction, and 47 false negatives, so an increase, which gives us 64 incorrect classifications. So we added two parameters and we have only two fewer misclassifications. And then you may ask, is it worth making the model that much more complex for such a slight decrease in misclassifications? And then we may look at the model coefficients. So again, here we have all of our regression slopes, including an intercept and their standard errors, wall tests with the corresponding degrees of freedom and p-value and the exponent of the regression coefficients and a confidence interval for the exponent of the regression coefficients. So let's look at the effect of test score, which is minus 0.42. And because there's an interaction term in the model, that represents the effect of test score for the alone condition. And we would have to change the dummy coding and the interaction term to get the effect of test score for the together condition. Right now, we can interpret this effect by taking the exponent of the regression slope to get the odds ratio associated with a one unit increase in test score. And that odds ratio is 0.66, which means that for a one unit increase in test score, the odds of prosocial behavior are multiplied by 0.66, so they become slightly smaller. But this effect is not significant. The p-value is about 0.05 and the 95% confidence interval includes the odds ratio of 1. So we can see that here. And an odds ratio of 1 would mean that the odds of prosocial behavior stay exactly the same. In other words, for chimps in the alone condition, this effect is not significant. And then of course we want to know what is the effect of test score in the together condition. And to get this, we need to get the odds ratio associated with a one unit increase in test score, which is equal to the exponent of the slope for the effect of test score plus the slope of the interaction. So that is the exponent of minus 0.42 plus 2.54 is 8.35. So for a one unit increase in test score, the odds of prosocial behavior become 8.35 times larger 
in the together condition. But then we may ask, is this effect also significant? So is the effect significant in the together condition? The very easiest way to get the significance of the effect in the together condition is to change the reference category of the dummy to make the together condition the reference category, then recompute your interaction term and re-estimate the model. Because then there's no need to hand compute the odds ratio of the effect of test score for the together condition. It just rolls out of the model and as we can see the odds ratio is 8.35 just like we calculated by hand. And we now get an exact p-value and 95% confidence interval. Specifically, the p-value is smaller than 0.05 and the 95% confidence interval excludes 1. So there is a significant positive effect of chimp intelligence on likelihood of acting prosocially in the together condition. And I found all of that in the table by looking at the p-value here and the exponent here and the 95% confidence interval here. So we conclude that the effect of chimp intelligence on prosocial behavior is significant in the together condition, but not in the alone condition. So how do we report this? Well, our first research question was, is there an effective condition on prosocial behavior? And we can report that there was a significant marginal effect of condition on prosocial behavior with a regression slope of 2.78 and a chi-square test statistic on one degree of freedom of 93.29, with a p-value smaller than 0.001. The probability of engaging in prosocial behavior was p equals 0.28 when chimps were alone, and p equals 0.86 when they were together. The odds ratio of this effect was 16.08. And then our second research question was, smart chimps might be more inclined to act pro-socially when another chimp is present. So is there an interaction between condition and test score? And our finding is, there was a significant interaction between condition and test score, report the regression slope, the chi-square test statistic and its p-value. The odds ratio of this effect was 12.67 meaning that when going from the alone condition to the together condition, the odds of engaging in prosocial behavior are multiplied with 12.67. In the alone condition, the effect of test score was not significant. Report the regression slope, its chi-square test statistic and its p-value. But in the together condition, the effect of test score was significant. Again, report the regression coefficient chi-square value and p-value. That is how you conduct logistic regression. You can apply it to lots of other cases outside of chimp prosocial behavior. So I hope you get lots of use out of it. Good luck in the tutorials.